All right, guys, time to cry back again today. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far. Welcome back to episode 52 of the Breaking Point podcast. We are back again. The season is now officially underway. The opening weekend has concluded. What a crazy weekend it was of upset, drama, all over the place. We've got so much to dive into today, and we've got the full crew back in business. We're here live on Twitch at the present time, after the fact on YouTube, all the other podcast platforms. Just love to see it. Lion, Austin, they're joining us again. Lion, how are you doing? Did you get much chance to catch the opening weekends? There was um, it was a crazy one. I'm just like glad that Call of Duty's back in business, to be honest. Yeah, I did. And I really enjoyed the matches. I think every year I go into the start of the season kind of pessimistic. And then I watch the matches and I enjoy it again. And uh, yeah, my love for the CDL continues regardless of the game. Austin, good weekend, all things considered. A 2-0 and zero start. Obviously didn't play your best card, but... So what championship winning teams do, they, they get results if they're not playing their best. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I was, I was pretty uh, pretty just happy that we, we went 2-0 <laughs> and kind of like scraped by because, you know, I think everyone thought that that first series wasn't wasn't too good. But at least we uh, we showed up and did really, really well against the, against the Thieves in the second one. So on to, uh, on to uh, Boston. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk about the predictions for that towards the end of the show, but Boy, do we have a lot to talk about because there's a lot of uh, a lot of surprises, I think, this past weekend. A lot of teams we're going to have to do some diving into as to what might be going particularly well or going wrong in some cases. But I wanted to start with ranked play because that's just been confirmed as of yesterday to be coming, we believe, on February the 14th when Season 2 drops. Because I think last year they said it was going to come in season for Season 2 and it came a couple of weeks after Season 2 arrives. We think this is coming with the launch. It's going to be a beta so that kind of tells me they could try to cover their back if there's issues with it. But um, still, they have now said, I'm pretty sure that the term that we had used before was visible skill ranks, I think. And now they've updated that to visible skill ratings. And obviously a rating implies an actual number, um, which sounds like an ELO system. So I'm actually really quite excited for that. Um, there's also two new maps coming, Casablanca and um, Gondola is what the other one's called. And both of those are described as three lane maps, three lane style maps. So that already makes me quite, well, you know, quite optimistic that at least one of those might be viable in competitive. Because certainly right now, I think we need another control map especially ideally we want another map that's viable for the other game modes as well so given that there's no london docks or uss texas coming with this or samurai de mod that we talked about hopefully one of these two maps is um is possible because i'm sure the pros will give it a go austin yeah i really hope uh i have a feeling that one of them at least one of them will be really good for uh for competitive um they both said three lane maps but i think the gondola one said like it's smaller, so I don't know. Like that, that pretty much. If it's too small, it just eliminates it. So, um, decoy or whatever it's called. Yeah, I'm actually pretty stoked to see how Casablanca runs because, like, right now, like we really, 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 really need competitive maps because <laughs> the vetoes are just in shambles and like, I don't know. Like right now, the map pool is probably in the worst state in like competitive COD history. Um, for. for for a minute like I can't, when's the last time we can't field enough maps to do vetoes man like bad no this so, is the first time for sure yeah so this is this is probably the worst state in competitive card history that we've been in for maps yeah um i'm pretty excited about the league play system i just think it is a little bit annoying that every year we won't get it any earlier than february um i think it's gotten to that point in the season and it's gotten quicker than usual where people are getting a little bit tired of the game. And so I think we know by now that whenever people get tired of the game, that's when Activision will release something new content-wise for the <laughs> game. And it came a little bit earlier this year. So that's good for oh, ranked well. play. Let's go. <laughs> um, with maps, yeah, there's like pretty much no veto system right now, I guess. Like there's no skill gap in the maps. There's no, you can't get better at one map and then have an advantage. And yeah, it's pretty tough viewing. But overall, the maps so far have been, I don't know, I kind of like Bow Cage. Like, am I crazy for that? I mean, I think you're a little bit faded, but not too faded, just because when I tune into Bocage, Bow Cage, Bow Cage, whatever, like, I can't see a word in which is pronounced Bow Cage. I think it's a French thing, I don't know. Who cares how you pronounce it? But when I tune in, 
I know that for the first five, six, seven minutes, it's just a complete mess. It's gonna, and then I tune back in, and a few minutes later, it's gonna be like 150, 150, and now it's one I should actually watch. You know, I don't know. I, I feel like it's just so chaotic that almost every game is kind of neck and neck, and it's only worth tuning into the last like two minutes to see what the conclusion is, because otherwise your brain gets fried watching it for ten minutes. That's my take. I don't know what you think, Austin. <laughs> Like, I don't know, like, the way that we played Bocage, honestly, didn't. I, I don't mind it. When it's like, I think right, right now, like, teams are forcing so many uh, SMGs on it, and it's getting, like, mixy and mixy. I don't like watching that. I don't like when it's just, it's just too, mu too much. You can't really break it down. It's just randomness. But mm. uh, I, I don't mind Tuscan. I like Tuscan a lot for control and for hardpoint. Um, I like Berlin for hardpoint, even though, like, right now, like, it's kind of got like the Arkloff peak where there's just like some like nonsense up on the map that you could you could like trim the fat on it and it would be so much better. Um, but uh, other than those two maps, I mean, I mean, hopefully we get Berlin for control at some point if they f can fix the spawns or the po or the point placement. But see, um, yeah. yeah, you know, I, I don't know. The, we, we got like three decent maps and then like yeah, I don't know. We just we need something fast for tlc to come in and save save this map pool because <laughs> ideally you probably don't want bocage in for the entire year um ideally Actually, destroy, i think is all right i don't mind it for search yeah Although, i don't wait, mind it for search? About search yeah i don't mind it for I search think, i think having bocage in is kind of cool because i don't think most teams are going to pick it for vetoes but if you're at like a super underdog just the bocage pick just chuck it in there get a map point frequency i kinda like it it is like frequency right yeah, but that was a that was a hell of a map. That was such a good map. Yeah, and I can't really say the same for Bookage, but I do enjoy <laughs> like the endings for the hard points. I find really entertaining because it is so mixy. Yeah, yeah it's and crazy. It's Anything can pretty much happen at the end there. That's the thing. We want this Casablanca map, whatever, to come through, so we can just have five maps, and then it's not too much of a problem. Um, because I I'll just throw this to you, Austin, again, because this is something that was kind of discussed during the weekend about how the control map is picked currently. The way it would traditionally work, given this, there'd be three maps in the pool, was that I guess the higher seed or I guess last year it would be whoever wins the coin flip gets to pick team A and then I guess team A gets to ban first or whatever and then the other team gets to ban second or whichever way around it was. Both teams get to ban one map they don't want to play and then the leftover map is then played. Um, and of course one team gets to choose side, which was a big deal last year because... Early in the game last year, defense just won every single round, especially on a, a map like Garrison. I've actually been really pleasantly surprised on a quick tangent here about control that despite everyone saying that, oh, wow, it, it's impossible to win offenses on, on Gather 2, impossible to win them on Tuscan. Like even towards the last weekend, towards the end, we saw a lot more teams really figure out strategies to win offenses like we saw london make some crazy plays or even optic in minnesota they just go b straight off the rip and like there were some really interesting ideas they were bringing out um it does create an interesting dynamic there and i'm excited to see that it's not just garrison oh unlucky lads you went four dead see you next round let's just you know, camp in the spawn um but of course, right now, the problem is with those three maps is that if you win the coin flip, which is literally a coin flip at the start of the game to determine who gets to ban what, then you get to just pick the control map because you get to choose which one you ban. Um, and that means that, and pretty much right now, Tuscan is very much SMG heavy and Gather 2 is very much AR heavy. So if you get lucky and you win the coin flip, then you basically get to pick the map that is going to give your team a big advantage in such an important swing game mode as Control. So I don't know if you think there's any other way around that, Austin, or whether you just think that the real solution is just to have a third viable map. <laughs> well, for like the major, it won't be coin flip, it'll be higher seed. So like that takes a lot of it out of it. Um, so like I won't mind it when it's then, but like right now it's like I don't know. You just can't plan anything because it's just so random going in. But um, you know we we tested Oasis, Berlin, and Bocage for that third map a little while ago. Um, Berlin obviously had that fluky like the attackers could just basically free cap a, a point before the defense even gets there. So you need to move the point or the spawns, or ideally even flip. Um, instead of spawning like left and right, like up and down almost. I don't know. They had to figure something out for that map to make that viable because I think Berlin is it would work really well for it. Um, 
I didn't mind Bow Cage. I thought Bow Cage, like my reasoning is, is if we're gonna be playing Bow Cage Hardpoint and Bow Cage S and D, just you mine as well. You know, I don't like Bow Cage, but if you're playing it for those two maps, like I you know, like, what's the big difference for control? Um, but uh, I guess Oasis didn't work. But um, you know, I guess where we're at right now, like my thing is, is like control will always get better the longer the season goes along because. Like, even for right now, like, I was talking to Carson, ev on, on Gav, every time a team goes B, they automatically lose right off the rip. Like, if you go B right away, you lose, no matter what right now. Um, you have to go A, you have to go boat, you have to get that control, then go yeah. ring. It, it's, it's like a step-by-step a, a -step process you have to do. And if you mess up that step-by-step, -step, then you're just, you lost a round. Um, but, as, as Turtle just put into the chat, like, right now... 29% of the offensive rounds are being won by attack and 35 on Tuscan, which I think is pretty healthy for, for the beginning of a uh, beginning of right. control. Um, the only thing I hate is that uh, right now round five is not, um, it does not go to ticks, which I think is a fundamental flaw for um, control is you need it to be ticks, ticks captured uh, for that map, for that round five. If you have that control, this gets exponentially better because right now teams are giving up on offense when they think it's like a lost cause. Whereas even if it only raised it up like, you know, like three, four percent on the win percentage, like there are could be rounds that like miracle rounds that could happen if teams kept putting on the pressure to get ticks, you know. So that's my thing. Uh, we get that. And, you know, if if there is a Hail Mary where we do get trophies, I think having only one player per team that can have a trophy, just one player, not everybody, there's a one player per team that can have a trophy would make a world of difference um, for a lot of these maps. So, you know. I do think eventually we're going to get to a point where control is pretty complex where it was last season. Because even though people used to hate it, by the end of the year, like, offense was winning, like, 40% of the rounds on, like, Garrison, on Checkmate, on Raid. So, I mean, Raid was offensive favored at one point. So, um, I think uh, once the meta, like, people are going to start learning different ways to push people back, like, spawn deeper. Like, like and and we're going to find ways to... to get better breaks so i think control like gets a lot more strategy heavy the deeper we go into the season right now it's more free flow it's more learning as you go this weird pushes so I i'm actually excited to see where it goes because right now i think for how i'll say bleak the rule set is it's actually pretty healthy for like the stats wise and if we can get a couple more things changed then we're going to be in a pretty good spot going forward i think yeah remember the start of last year with checkmate and how it was like 90% of rounds went to defense. Yeah. It was ridiculous. So, so bad year, to watch, it was, right? Yeah, it was then, terrible. It was but always year, round five. Like yeah. I Did actually you, enjoyed it. Do you remember like once teams learn that once they push up the wood, then they spawn really deep and then you can get lane and then you can, you can start doing more pushes and the next thing you know, win percentage was at like 40% for offense. No. Yeah, and then people actually started stacking it and like, yeah, yeah. The, it, control gets better as the year progresses. Um, so I agree with yeah. that. Yeah, Chigma ended at 31%, but like, I'd be interested to see those stats stage one compared to stage five tail. I don't know if you could bring that up, but that would be, that'd be interesting to know. But uh, let's continue really in terms of this viewing experience discussion, because I think this weekend's, I think really Esports Engine and everyone involved with the broadcast did a fantastic job. I'm so happy that there's like an in-person desk. We've also got Bryson Tun coming back to casting. Like, yes, we lost Maven and Merc. That's an L, but... You know, I guess we got to look on the bright side. Bryce and Tom, great duo. I guess they'll be out there in the States as well doing this with any luck. Um, however they're going to do it, they're going to be there. Uh, Miles and Chance killed it. Lando and Study have improved, I think, significantly from where they were last year. Actually enjoyed some of their casts, which um, couldn't necessarily say last year, but it's definitely getting better. And um, the desk was fantastic, especially because it's in person. So on the whole, awesome stuff. Uh, given the state of Vanguard's, like we've found ourselves in a position where the game's, if anything, more watchable than it was last year at a time. So that's a massive yeah. positive. One thing to say on the co-streams, because day one, Tim the Tapman brought out the co-stream and he was killing it. And the most viewed match of the weekend, considering all factors, was Los Angeles Grillers versus Boston with 81k. The Optic game had 79k against London in the game five. Um... Of course, that was without the co-stream on the second day. 
But considering Tim the Tat, I think that series, the LAG Boston one, peaked on the main broadcast probably around about 45.50. And then Tim the Tatman stream brought in another about 30, 30, 35. Um, mm. so that, like, that's awesome. And that really shows, and he was having a good time doing it. Loads of people were in there. I'm sure we got new fans as a result of that. Uh, I was just imagining a world line where, like, Friday, Tim the Tatman co streams it. Saturday, Courage JD co streams it. And then Sunday, get Dr. Disrespect. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah. They could do this if they wanted, or they could do all at the same time. Who knows? But hopefully yeah. that shows them like, wow, um, there's a lot of potential here for this. Or even getting Zuma the ability to co-stream. Like, because he currently does it where he watches them, but he has everything covered apart from the scoreboard and kill feed. And it's Which, though. nice to watch. Yeah. But then he'll later issue, upload. Yeah. yeah. But later he'll upload. Like, have you seen he'll upload the full match with his reaction? And that's really good to watch. Um, but my opinion on the um, the viewing right now, I actually do like one component a lot, and that it's the first time they've carried over the scores at the top. So like the scoreboard and like the players, like it's the same as last year, and I like that a lot because it gives like a a branding almost to the CDL, and it doesn't keep switching up each year and get confusing. And so I do like that a lot. That is just all I wanted to really say is that that impressed me that they didn't you know start fresh. They yeah, impressed me as well. I thought it was going to be tragic. I was expecting like Sledgehammer so would put together some like, really scuffed yeah. podcaster. We're going to have to deal with that. But it's actually, um, they actually copied and pasted it, no? Like, yeah. so you're telling me you can't copy and paste league play? I think <laughs> that Sledgehammer have done some of the best podcasters. Like, AW was good. World War II was probably, in my opinion, the That's best podcast actually. it was. Like, the scores at the top are so clear. It's not too complex. And like, not too harsh on the eye and i think they've done a good job by carrying it over from last year as well what do you think austin yeah, i i thought they did amazing like the in-person desk was was amazing i'm yeah. so glad they brought that back i can't believe that took two years um because it just feels way more official it feels like instead of a podcast it's like an actual show which is something we have been like desperately missing i think um I also really liked how they actually have highlights and plays, and it's not only it's not only more highlights of of like what you just saw on stream. It's like highlights from POVs that weren't on stream. Like I noticed mm -hmm. that one round, I think it was somebody got like a four piece or three piece in S and B, and it wasn't shown on stream. But on the highlight, it was that person getting the three piece. And I was like, that's 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 elite. That's amazing. Um, and Car uh, Carson. Uh, did an amazing job. Uh, I think this is the first time ever. I mean, I, analysts have been tracking hills, hill break percentage and, and, and hold percentage for about like four years now. And we've never, ever, ever seen it talked about, mentioned, discussed on a broadcast ever. Um, and this year is finally first event. We already have it. It's like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and he's and he's getting really creative with like a lot of like the keys to victory, which is what I like. Um, he's 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 just there's so much. There's so many big upgrades and it's only the first week of stage one, which yeah. like hopefully we keep getting more and more packages brought in and from uh for the rest of the season. I, I've really, really enjoyed like the product they've put out so far. Yeah, like I feel like regardless of the game being the way it is, the product is getting more and more complete which is great for if we do get a really good title, everything's in place for it to be mega. But that's hopeful. Yeah, that's my favorite thing. Like when it goes to the break, when they have like a three, five minute break, and I don't just have to watch a screen that says three minutes, 259, 258. I get to watch the highlights and I get to see the previous match scores, the current match score, like the fixtures. I get to also see, um, well, it's basically like how it was in the, golden mlg run day events right when it used to be like that so um that was always a good time let's dive into these actual teams then because uh, wow what a crazy weekend i mean we had some some unreal results to be honest and um i mean yeah firstly i want to talk about london they played the first game of the weekend i think if there were two biggest surprises of the week to me, I think one might be Optic and then the other one might be London for very positive reasons. I was not expecting them to look quite this good because against Seattle at the kickoff, they kind of got bodied. And I thought that, okay, Seattle clearly have put things together very quickly on their end with the veteran and the three rookies. I thought that it might take London a little bit longer. But um, 
doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, they came out and just battered Florida in probably the quickest series. I don't know how quick that series was. I don't know totally if you know those stats, but um, like 40 minutes. it was an insanely fast series. I Because this game plays really quick and the search and destroy, especially, I forget, they might have been on Tuscan. I think it might have been a Tuscan search. The rounds play very quick on that map because it's like, super close Siege. range. Like, Oh yeah, no, Siege, yeah, sorry, yeah. But still, I think the a lot of the rounds yeah. in this game play really fast. So that game was over like five minutes and then the control was like comfortable as well. That was legitimately yeah. an insane fast it. series. So it was eight minutes for the, for the hard point, which is like extremely quick. Seven mm. rounds in eight minutes for the S and D and then 12 minutes. So it was around 28 minutes. And since they Whoa. actually started at three o'clock, like first off, I missed that. Thank you. Esports engine yes. for starting <laughs> the actual matches at three o'clock when the matches are supposed to start. Nothing drove me more crazy last year. when it was like, Oh yeah, we're starting matches at four. And then four thirty was the actual start time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that match was done about probably at like four. They started at three, done done probably about like three thirty-five. Yeah, quick day at the office for the London boys. Um, but I mean, then they go on to be optic later on. That they complete this crazy reverse sweep. I'm sure we'll talk about when we discuss optic. Um, but I mean, like, and if anything, in that game too, when Zero was down low, if you'd have heard the bomb getting picked up by Illy, you might have got the kill. Like, if anything, London could have won that series more comfortably than they did. Um, and to me, they looked like. See, like definitely the better team in that series gizmo looks unreal i he wasn't the top of my list on this team as someone who i thought was going to be a standout i had afro nasty gizmo i guess behind but um he was absolutely on fire this week he was popping four pieces like it's nothing against optic he seems to also have this kind of like i see cool mentality like just listening to him speak and the way he holds himself it doesn't feel like he really feels the pressure which is um obviously a good characteristic I mean, they're the only team with, at least according to the stats we put out, there might be 100% correct, but Afro and um, Gizmo both were the only team that had two players in the top five KDs um, at the present time, at least according to that, the way we were looking at it right there. Yeah, with kickoff and with week one. Yeah, with kickoff and week, with, with week one. Yeah, exactly. Only the only team with two players in the top five KDs. Um, so yeah, it just seems to me that London and Seattle are kind of leading the way in this roster building philosophy now of a veteran AR and then three young guys that are going to absolutely rip apart your favorite players, I guess, Lion. Yeah. Um, yeah, they looked great. But the Optic series for me is one of the most uh, painful. Ex like being an Optic fan is like, oh, no, I can't say that. But it's just, it's the worst, man. And like, ever since, I, th I, I would say ever since 2016, I haven't, there's only been one occasion where being an Optic fan has been enjoyable. And it was Champs 2017. And the rest has just been, oh. But anyway, London, um, I think you were right. The, way, the philosophy in which they created their team, it seems to be like the meta right now. It's have all these cracked young players and then have a really good vocal leader who can harness all their potential and that definitely showed with seattle um but if i was going to do like a power rankings right now it's almost impossible because like the only team that seems to be slightly behind the pack is paris and the rest just seem like they could beat each other on any given day but that's just my take yeah what do you reckon, Austin? i i was again going back to the pre-kickoff I was really high on London. I said like London and Seattle were the two, like I thought we had the hardest first round matchup by far. Like the two teams are like constructed actually very similar. They both have a veteran IGL uh, main AR and then they have like three young kids. So like I knew eventually this season that both Seattle and London were going to be really, really good. Um, I knew Gizmo was going to be good. Uh, probably. Okay. So like stage one elite last season, before the XM4 got really, really good, uh, it was still the um, the AK. This is right when the AK got banned. I was watching his team play. I don't remember. I think his was like Hot Tub something. or I, I forget what he was on. <laughs> yeah, it's all of that. But uh, I just remember noticing him because he, would, he was the only one using the XM4 at the time. And he would always sit boat on Miami. And he always did really good. And like I always knew that like he was... One of the better flexes in like the the elite over in EU, and so I didn't know how he was going to translate once he got into the pro league, but he's really like surprised me with this how like great he's played. He's got the number two KD so far with a one point three seven. Um, 
he's he's just playing really solid. He he's he's doing good in hard point. He's doing good in S and D, and he's got a one point five six in control right now. So like, he's doing really well all around. I thought he was like the the shining moment for them. Um, out of uh, out of all the out of uh, all the players on that team, I I think he's been like the standout so far. And uh, like even in the the optic match, like he ended with a one point one six. Like he was frying. So I um I I think this team has a has a pretty high ceiling. It's just depending on like how uh, it was House House Tarth. That's what it was. In Game of Thrones. I was always laughing at that. But um I think they have a really high ceiling. It's just um you know with with young kids. It's just like usually when they're not even that young. Uh, but they're like twenty. But. With like rookie, like more inexperienced on the main stage, like if they hit a bump in the road, that's gonna be the hardest hardest point in the season for them. It's like how they rebound from that, how they uh, how they maintain their their edge they have over everybody. Because now, like once you once you start hot, like if I wanted to go look at a vod of like a, you know like a Berlin hard point team, I'm obviously gonna go look at whoever's the top in that on that. And right now, it's probably London. So I would watch a London vod, and then you start like. Oh, yeah, you start you start noting and doing stuff that they're doing. So, like maintaining that edge is is the hardest thing to do. And then like rebounding from a from a defeat, rebounding from something that happens to you is one of the hardest things to do. But I actually have a lot of faith in like Trey, um, like leading those guys, just because like I got to work with him back in Black Ops Four. So like I know like his mentality about things. So I actually have a lot of like high expectations for them going throughout the season. I think this might be like London's best season since. Is I think what they finished top six in uh, Modern Warfare. I bet you they'll they'll probably beat that this season if if things go pretty smooth towards the end of the season. Yeah, they were top four champs that year. Um, yeah, but regular season I guess wasn't so good. But they were a decent team that year. Like they were always pretty scary to play, especially in the searches. This year they're scary to play for more reasons than just they're a good search team. Like they're scary to play because the talent is um, it's difficult to outslay. Um, team in a very similar boat, Seattle Surge, definitely worthy of discussion. They only played, no, they actually played two games this week, of course. They beat New York in another very quick series, just wiped the floor with them, frankly. New York, a team that I was very concerned about given their bracket. We'll talk about them towards the end of the video, but um, I mean, yeah, very concerned given the bracket that New York had and playing Seattle first online never seemed to be a recipe for success. So Seattle just 3-0 them without a problem. They then play Toronto, which um, was quite the series, really. I thought that they were just going to steamroll them, but Toronto are just such a hard team to beat. Honestly, if there's one team in the league that I think is the hardest to beat. I think it's Toronto. Like, these guys, anything could be happening. They'll somehow find a way to push you to a game five, make it close. Really tough to beat in search and destroy. Um, and the whole series, pretty much Sib and Pred were having their way until the final round where Accuracy stepped up, hopped on the bomb, ninja it, Vance didn't check it, and they went a crazy game five round 11. Um, now look, whether that means that Seattle technically now are the number one team in the game, I think can be argued. Um, from my perspective, I would say that Toronto won the series on land against Seattle, and Seattle have now won this one online, so they're one in one in series count, and I'd probably argue that the one on land, especially in the grand finals, carries more weight. So I'd probably still say Toronto number one, but you could make a reasonable case right now that Seattle are the best team in the game, um, which I didn't think I would be saying <laughs> like six months ago, right, when uh, you know the, this whole stuff was going down towards the end of last season. So um, yeah, remarkable. Like, What do you think, Lion? Crazy... Crazy how good this roster is already. I thought it was going to take time to, for them to put it together, but immediately you don't want to play Seattle. They're favorites in like every series they play. Yeah, like even a month ago before the kickoff classic, I didn't have crazy expectations for this team. Um, but I don't think we've really seen them in a state where Pred or Sib aren't having a good series. I feel like they stay in series because those guys are so cracked that they can even out the slaying or even blow out the other team. So I'm just wondering, when it isn't going so smoothly, how do they react? And I think we kind of saw that in the grand final of the kickoff classic when Toronto kind of just handled them pretty comfortably. Um, and so that's what I'm looking for with this team is that currently, whenever they're firing, they look like the best team in the league. But when things get a little bit rocky, I wonder where they're going to be. Uh, what do you reckon, Austin? Yeah, I think the, the Seattle team, I would probably put that uh, they're like the number one team right now. The only thing I'm a little bit concerned is um, I want to see like a more balanced uh, like uh, like stats across everyone because like when you look at the Toronto series, um, everyone went negative besides Sib who had a 1.46. So 
So, yeah. like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, um, I just want to see like a more consistent performance out of like everybody across the board. But like right now, they they are just really ahead in like the teamwork, the way they like hit out hit out stuff. Um, I saw Shift talking about this the other day. It was just like they know when the pinch, when they know when to actually go for a long route. Like their timings on the map are like crazy. So. Like right now, their teamwork is is up there with like Toronto, and I think that's how you beat good teams consistently. Is like have really good teamwork, be really good with your timings, be really good with like where where every, you know where everyone has to be on at at all times, and you know like when when someone's making a move here, this is how you react. So I just think um, eventually, like you're gonna see like Mac just have like a really good like perf- like series performance that like really stamps like stamps it on the map for him. Um, so. I'm actually really excited to see how how far the Seattle team can go. It's like the same thing as London. Like these two teams, like these young kids, we really don't know how high they can like the the level of play that they can hit. And the fact that they're starting out this early, actually playing so well, they ha- they all had really good performances on land. Like this might be like the year where we have like four or five young kids just like consistently putting on, which is I, I think that's awesome for the scene. I feel like we kind of had that last year with all the new challenges players. What do you think? Not like this though. Like those teams, like like who who came in last year that that Thank could you. that could win champion that like Sandy won. Yeah, actually Sandy won. But like everyone else, I don't think they were thought of as like a consistent championship contender. Like now, there was right now, from the bench. But oh yeah, there was. I there guess wasn't like too. yeah. There wasn't like that. I don't know. It, this year does feel different in that sense, though. Like it does kind of feel yeah. like a changing of the guard is underway whereas last year it kind of felt like the beginnings of it and now it kind of feels like wow you know i'm not i'm not looking for the names that have been around a few years to drop crazy numbers i'm actually looking at these kids that have just arrived but it, it's great to see the the comparison between the two like new york for example is crazy with uh the, like the 10 year age gap between the the team but yeah, yeah, yeah it's, we it's, it's weird it's just because like i like right now with with pred and sid like I would legitimately think they could win a championship any major right now. And with London, with Gizmo and Nasty, and I, I still consider Afro a rookie. He played what, like a, a stage um, last year? Like, yeah, a stage or two. Like those three guys, like I would, I would not be surprised if they won a major, you know? Um, I don't think we've ever had teams where like hacks of rookies come onto one team and then mm-hmm. just instantly were like, oh, they could win a championship. Like I don't remember the. Like, what's that happen? United. Oh yeah. So oh, I guess it does happen. It's hard to keep track of all this stuff because like the careers, like everyone's, you're like a veteran after like two years. Like Awakening is like a veteran now, so it's like hard to like remember like the the all rookie that. years. But like, um, yeah, I, I guess I, I don't know. I'm just excited because I like when when the new people come on the block and do really well, and then like we get people like like people forget like Skies for instance. Skies just came in in Black Ops Four. And like he, yeah. he has a good brand, like he has a good personality. Like, uh, there's actually a lot of like newer players that have come in in the last like three years that um have great brands, great personalities. And I actually like yeah. Gizmo's interview. I have like really high hopes for him. I like, I think Nasty's like really, really, really good. Sib, I like his interviews have actually been pretty like, I like them a lot. He's pretty, he's like down the earth right now, just like I'm grinding. Pred has like an amazing personality. I, th- I think he's gonna be really good. Capsule and Nero. There's like there's a lot of young kids that could have like good brands for the CDO, and you know obviously they're playing really well. So uh, I'm yeah. actually pretty pretty shocked. Yeah, one That's thing the I like. Exciting. Go online. Oh, okay. Uh, one thing I liked about um this year is that, or oh, and I guess the CDL in general, but also something I dislike is that I like that players come into already existing brands like rookies and build them up even higher, just like Seattle right now, just like London. But previously in the CWL, I my favorite part of every year was seeing that like underdog rookie team come into contention early in the game. I think in BO4, midnight. Today, midnight, exactly. IW, it was E United. Uh, 20, who would you say wasn't Black Ops 3? Like, was there a team like that at all that was not really, eh? The it time when just... like Cloud Nine Havoc wasn't he like younger at that point? Oh yeah, I guess that's a good point. And then Aix was like kind of their older head in that team. Yeah, um, assault. Oh, but yeah. uh, I mean the Splice team towards the end as well. Like they had a couple of you know yeah. bands, for example. Yeah, but now in the CDL um, it's different. It's now 
they'll bring in these players into these existing brands and then grow them. And I, I do like that a lot. It's just I miss that like anonymous sort of way it was done previously in the CWL. Pro am yeah. though. Pro am. Yeah, that is exciting. That is exciting. Very exciting. I just, do we know yet if it's gonna? It is teams from pro and amateur, right? Not mixture of pros and amateurs. As in, like the teams. Nah, it's the full rosters. Yeah. Oh, it's full rosters. I'm pretty sure. I don't yeah, really know because they haven't like it's really released twelve pro any. teams, and I think it's the. I think there's going to be, I guess, some sort of qualifier for each region, and like the best European team goes, the best North American, the best Latin American, the best APAC team goes. I think that's really? how they do it. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Yeah, be I might sick. be wrong, but I think it's the best from each region goes, and there's obviously some qualifier to get in. I hope the Spanish guys get in from Europe. I'd love to see that. Um, if that is how it works, they might change it. But I think, yeah, Roosevelt says that's right. So I think that's correct. From yeah, what I've read at the time. going to win the CDL. Yeah, they could win it. That's the thing. They could actually win yeah. it. Oh, that's the knows? thing. It's like, this year's the first year out of all the years in the CDL. This is like the first year where it actually makes sense for amateur orgs to come in. And this is the one year we don't have like anyone right now. We have like war. And I think, um, I don't even know. Like we have renegades over in APOC, but like this is the first year where it actually does make sense to have an amateur team. <laughs> but like exactly, we don't yeah. really, we don't really have any yet, which Especially is kind of shocking. Especially once they determine though, like let's say the Spanish guys win or whatever, or whoever wins from any region, like they'll get picked up by an org. There'll be orgs will be fighting for them. I mean, the uh, Journeys team has won four exactly, straight yeah. cups, and they are, I I think they're dom the two Spanish teams are dominating the elite right now, and they they haven't been picked up yet. I, I don't know. I just I think yeah, this is where you take a risk because, like, whatever amateur team does go to that pro am, it's just like perfect for like you're gonna get so much publicity because like people want to see if those amateur teams can win, and your name's just linked to it. Per like, it's just it's the only time that makes perfect sense to do it. And like right now, like what Team War did, like picking up Paul X and Gravity and Venom and and Jimbo, like, you're getting a good team early, you're taking that risk. Like, that's where I think we're going to start seeing a lot more amateur teams come in in the next month, because, what, the Pro-Am's in April? So, what's that, two months away, three months away? So, you're going to want to start, start snagging these top teams now before you really don't have a shot to uh, to make it. So, I don't know, I'm expecting big things in the next couple, of, like, two months, you know? Exciting times. That was a really good tangent. I enjoyed that, and, um, you know, it's exciting, right? Next team is going to be FaZe. We're going to Austin, obviously, as we talked about at the start. Difficult time, at least against Paris. I, it was a surprising week for me because Selian was just by far your guys' best player. Like, Sel was killing it out of control, stats out of control, every single game mode. Just unbelievable. Um, Simp didn't really do that much. Abizi didn't have the greatest week either. So it was interesting to me to see those guys because, I don't know, based on early scrims and early tournaments we saw, like, Abizi and Simp seemed to be in some of these tournaments, are even better than they were last year. So it was a surprise to see these games um, not really go their way. But that's the thing. You guys got through it anyway. Um, the Paris series wasn't pretty. Obviously, a lot of a lot of Gavatu being played, which I guess you guys don't seem so comfortable on compared to the other maps, especially in the control, obviously. I guess you didn't really have a choice on that front because probably they won the coin flip. Um, so that is what it is. And then you really started to kick it up a gear against Thieves again. I was quite impressed. At, and even the last two maps against Paris, it just seemed like somehow backs against the wall didn't play well the first three maps really turned it up a notch and won the hard point in the search and destroy comfortably and that's what i thought was very impressive here about phase is like yes they guys underperformed but when push came to shove like you really turned turned up to another gear which um and it was the same against thieves really like game one you lost incredible tuscan hard point um and then the tuscan control you just came out and it looked like the phase of last year really you just, just come out swinging 3-0 in control no pressure at all and then win the rest of the series comfortably as well so of course there was some talk about the server that la thieves have to play on against you guys i think they were saying how they might have to play on a texas server against you guys but against other teams they have a better server um so but like they're based in la they they get what it comes with right like i guess the the call was theirs and their organizations um but yeah what are, what are your thoughts Austin, on the performance on the week i mean as you said at the start happy to get up with the two and zero but i'm sure there's a lot here to work on right oh we played like shit like uh <laughs> we you know it's a little bit rough um i think we're, we're i said it like we're at like 50 percent right now 
but like the fact that we're still scraping by and like beating these teams says a lot to us because like every map you look at like in that Paris series oh boy like it could have been a low five like um even that like every map there was like a lot of mistakes you're making just like overthinking things communication it's just small stuff but if you're if you're gonna play a good team like they're gonna be able to take advantage of that um but at the at the good point is like we're at fifty percent and still two and L and we're still I think we've turned a corner like I think that 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 Saturday match versus Thieves like I think we played bad versus Paris against Thieves like we messed up on that Tuscan that Tuscan hard point but other than that it was pretty clean like uh I think we dominated the I think that siege like we we pretty much cleaned cleaned up on that one uh the control was a was a wash like I think well, we three owed them in like seven minutes and then the um. The hard point was what was the last hard point? Oh, bow cage, bow cage. I think that was probably the cleanest bow cage we've seen in the, C in the CDL so far. Uh, no, actually, that's false because I think we had a two fifty to seventy, didn't we? But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Look, I, I, this reminds me a lot of like stage five last year for us. It's just like a lot of like communication and uh, and um, you know, uh, like overthinking things, just playing it on the same page. Uh, I think we had a lot of. Just, I think we're the best rotating team in hardpoint right now. It's just having the holds. Like if you if you're gonna rotate, you gotta make your holds worth it. And right now, you know our holds just aren't a hundred percent. They're just not there, which is hurting us in hardpoint. And you know, in control, obviously, like Gavutu, uh, we're not hundred percent there. And so, like that's why I think like people are like really doubting us. But then when you get maps like Bowcage, Berlin, uh, Huskin, and you get all like any any S and D right now. I, I firmly believe we could beat anybody. Um, once we get those maps, and then you like you see like the the old phase as people call it. So like I think it's just I think it's just putting everything together. I think honestly we just need more more practice. I think we just need more reps and just you know keep working it out. I think like right now the fact that we're two and zero and we 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 crawled by like we like clawed by these teams is amazing. And you know I, I don't think we could have it any better for where we currently are but you know hopefully we do keep improving because you know i don't i don't want to be in this form going into the major i want to, i want these guys to feel confident i want them to, to definitely feel like we are the number one team and to, that we can smoke any team so we're, we'll get there i think like this this past weekend we turned a corner pretty good because i think like this week's of practice so far has been going really really well so i'm excited yeah, what I've gathered from a viewer for FaZe is that they've been winning matches and the best player, if not the best two players in the game, aren't even playing close to their potential. And that's extremely scary, that they can still finish matches. They're such a, a well-structured team that you guys can just not really be in the series, and then next map you guys are straight back in the series and in control of it. And that just shows the old FaZe. So I'm just excited to see when Simp will start playing at the level that we're like accustomed to seeing because that's that's bound to happen he's just that he's that guy like so i'm excited yeah. for that like even like tyler so tyler had a, a 1.12 a bz at, at, against la thieves and uh he was playing really well like his decision making like I, it was back like the thing with them is like once they get into a groove like those, those two guys are probably the smartest SMGs in the league in terms of like timing in terms of like playing off of each other like once they find they once they get into that rhythm and they they start like getting into like okay we have we have somebody's over here then I can make this route and once we start like really capitalizing on that like that's when those guys are going to click cuz when we're a really good holding team that's when you see Simp with like a 1.5 just like absolutely running house because what he does is is he's just so smart with his flanks with his routes and the thing with Tyler is like once once we're in, into like our systems actually working really well, like he just he's the most annoying player to play against. So the fact that we're doing really 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 well right now, like two and zero, and I think what we have a two we're two and two in hard point. I think we're three and zero in S and D. Um, I I don't know. I I just have a lot of confidence that that LA Thieves match was really crucial for us to turning a point uh, turning a corner because you know you could just see we played pretty sloppy in that first hard point. And then if you rewatch the last the next three maps, it just looked it looked different. It looked like something flipped, you know? And then like I think we had a really good conversation. We've had really good practice. I think like as long as we keep this up and like keep pushing to be better, I think we're gonna be like that number one team where like you know, like that unfuckwithable energy that we had at, at one point last year. I feel like if we can keep putting in the work 
And like that's the thing, like keep putting in the work because right now Toronto and Seattle and London and even Texas and even LA Thieves, like all these teams are putting in massive amount of hours right now to get better. So we just have to outwork them and let and let our talent like shine once we get get that down. Yeah. Do you think that it could be because of the strange timings in this game? Like Bocage, for example, I keep bringing it up, but that is a topic of discussion. Like the timings on Bocage are so strange. It's so mixy that it almost people chow the whole time just in hopes of getting good timings and getting like a two piece, three piece. Do you think that that dynamic has been a bit strange for your team to adjust to because usually you guys are outthinking the, the opponents and on that map you can't really? No, no, because I actually like. Weirdly enough, like if you go look at our hold percentages in the matches, like Bocage is our best. Bocage, we actually slow down the game. If you look at the pace of kills per minute in that one, we actually slow down the game to a pace that like you haven't seen yet. And I think it has a lot to do with just how our how our setups are going. Like we're doing a really good job of slowing it down. I think for the other maps, like Berlin and Tuscan, uh, when you're not holding very well, like if you're rotating and you have that early setup and then you get broken. It, that hill instantly turns mixy, and that's when it's like teams are just taking routes, teams are just hitting random stuff, teams are dead. like it just you have to take advantage of when you have full setups, and we're not doing that right now. And so once we lose that initial setup, then you're just sprinting to the hill because you're trying to recover, and then if that doesn't work, then you're rotating and you're getting weird timings on the rotation. So it's like we just have to start taking advantages of our holds when we get a chance to, and you just just play off of that better because like right now, like I feel like. Uh, we have really good setups for, for all these maps. It's just like putting that together in matches because our practice has been insane. Like our practice has been better than last year. Like we've been doing really, really well in practice. It's just about, you know, make, like practice should be harder than matches. And and so like right now it's like the opposite. And like we just have to figure out how to translate that better. And I think like literally I, I really think that LA Thieves match was just so crucial to like having that happen because it was just like as a COD player, like a lot of it is mojo, you know, a lot of it is feeling confident and like you could just see it in those final three maps. Like the mojo was kind of backed and I, I don't know. I, I liked like the, the, the in-game swagger that we had in that final like couple, like you, I don't know. I just saw it in that control and I was just like, this gives me vibes of stage three and stage one of last year, not stage five. It, like when we played Paris, I was like, oh damn, this is like stage five of last year. We're, <laughs> we're scraping by, you know, but yeah, yeah I don't know. It's just about being consistent because you know, one day we're struggling against Paris, the next day we're we're beating LA Thieves. Like, I don't want to come out against Boston on Saturday and be struggling. So, like, it's about keeping down, like, foot on the pedal this week, keep working, which is, like, something, like, I don't know, everyone's really hungry right now, which I like. I like that a lot. So, like, keeping that will be, will make us more consistent week to week, day to day. So, I'm actually excited for, like, this week of practice and, like, playing Boston because one thing with Zinni is, like, he is... They have been working like really hard, and uh, that's one of those teams where, you know, you, you like I feel like teams are gonna like sleep on Boston for some reason, and like I like our team is not hundred percent. Like we are solely focused on them. We've been talking about them for the last four days now, but like uh, I don't know. I feel like they're a really good team to play against because they'll keep you in check, and like they'll they'll always be working really hard. It's the same thing with Paris. Paris has been like really grinding behind the scenes, even though people have been like giving them shit for not having the most talent but they've been probably putting in like probably the most amount of hours practice wise so like a lot of these teams are working which is really really nice because it keeps you on your toes it keeps you in, in like peak performance so i don't know i'm just really excited to play play boston on on, on saturday so um i have a question austin hit me and you don't have to answer this but how many hours would you say of boston scrims have you watched <laughs> Right now, that like so when they were scrimming like er, like earlier in the season, I was watching every single one. Um, but like, I honestly haven't I haven't tuned in since, since for for a while since he moved to Boston. I think what was it like last last Tuesday? I don't even think they've really been streaming. Honestly, let me let me look now. Now, yeah, now I'm have. curious. They have. I don't know. I've, I've, I've been I've been like yeah, yeah they're, they're scrimming today, right maybe. now. Yeah. That was today was their first day. They they're back. So who knows? Maybe I'll go through. But uh. <laughs> I um I don't know I, I've had like a change of philosophy on stuff like I don't know I, I like right now I think we need to focus on ourselves and not overcomplicate the game because like right now I think it's like a communication overthinking problem that we have and so like right now it's about simplifying the game for our players simplifying our system so like they're confident in it and like and able to produce to what we've seen them in the past so right now isn't about 
doing the most anti-stratting and telling them the real X's and O's and, and adding more layers to it. Right now it's about simplifying our base, nailing that down 100%, and then, you know, towards the major, then we can start adding more and more stuff. Because if you start overcomplicating stuff, start, like, adding, like, oh, my God, so, like, they do this and this round, they do this on this hill, they do this, this is their break, this is their next hole, this is how they do this and this and this and this. Then your guys are thinking more about them than they're thinking about your own system. And if your own system isn't a hundred percent, then you're you're just all over the place. And that's how you're inconsistent. That's how you start messing up against lower tier teams. So right now, especially in these early like qualifying matches, and especially since we're two and zero, um, it's more about yourself, like strengthening your system, strengthening your map pool, like. Even it's it's not like it's not like we have it's it's not like we if we lose against Boston we're out of the out of the the tournament you know so like Boston will be a good one to see where our map pool is to see where our system's at to see where our holding is at because that's a, that's obviously a key for us see where you know if we can keep S and D consistent see where control is at like everything will be like that's what I think these qualifying matches are for is for evaluating yourself and then when you're in the tournament that's when you like kick it in the high gear so. I don't know. That, that's that's my that's my long answer to that. So no, I really haven't been watching too much Boston stuff. But you know, I probably will towards like uh, or actually what we play Saturday. So we I probably will the next like two days just to just to see how they're doing. You know. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful stuff. I see things kicking off on the timeline right now. But before we get into New York, we're gonna talk about Optic Baby because. Um, an unreal weekend, and I lied, head in hand, I get it. I I think at times you don't know whether to laugh or cry. It's so predictable how it goes. Like, Optic came up with so many ways to lose round 11s last year. They had everything. It was all there. The 1v3, like, all sorts of misplays, bad rotations, get, you know, throwing away lives in 1v1s. They did it all. This year, they're going again. They're coming back with more ways to lose round 11s. They've got the four versus three on Bacage against London. They've got a nice early advantage. They decide to wait a little bit, which is fine. Then they kind of go in one by one. They get picked apart. They lose the rounds. And then against, um, I mean, the one against Minnesota was just pretty tragic, frankly, because Illy, not really sure what else he could have done. It was just a tough spot. But if anything, you should have said, look, Minnesota left the bomb all the way back in spawn. You can't let them get the bomb down for free. I don't know. That'd be my perspective. Um, Look, I have so many questions on Optic. I'll just kind of fire away with what I wrote down in my notes, and then I'll pass it to you, Line, to kind of give your perspective here, because, look, they lost two Game 5 Round 11s. It's not the end of the world. It's the very first week of the game. They were very competitive in both series, but they should have won both series. The series were on a platter for both of them, 2-0 up in the first series against London, and um, they should have won the, the hard point game four against uh, Minnesota on the Berlin. No excuses really for losing that one. Like the plays I was seeing be made, I was mind blown. Like I thought in ranked play or when I used to have a team back in Black Ops 3 and sometimes we would stagger our pushes. Like one guy goes in and dies, the next guy. And okay, okay, let's not do that, lads. Stop staggering, wait for each other. And you'd have thought on a pro level, this kind of is second nature at this point, but apparently not. Illy's just flying in on his own, he's dead. Dashi flies in on his own, he's dead. Illy's spawning back here. Scum sitting over there down on the dock side thinking, what is going on? Why are my teammates all dying? Like it just felt like when the pressure was on, the full collapse comes through. Like they looked good until it was crunch time. Then when it was crunch time, collapse comes through. Um, and a lot of people are saying right now, do they lack leadership in these crucial moments? Is Illy stepping up to the plate? Can anyone else step up to the plate? You look at the other top teams, the likes of Seattle, they've got accuracy. Of course, phase of Arcities, the Bants on Toronto, for example. Like, and we know the communication on these teams from what we've heard in listenings is really solid, especially in those kind of pressure moments. For the Optic guys, that is a question whether that's the case. Um, Dashi also had a difficult week statistically, which is not what is usual, right? Like if Dashi's coming out and dropping a point seven, point eight, point nine, um, that's not a good sign for your team because he's there to drop the numbers. I'm not saying like he's the problem or anything, but just that's not a good sign when Scump's the one positive in this particular series. Um, you know, Shotzi had one awful series, then he was really good, and he was really good on a Tuscan hard point, then he had an awful rest of the series until the final search and destroy. So it just seems like so much inconsistency there. Um, 
to me, it just seems like loads of echoes of last year, right? Just from my perspective, it just felt like so many of these issues, we saw them have last year, they're recurring again. And I just don't want Optic to make the same mistake as last year, where if the team isn't going to work, and we feel like we, New York have already decided the team isn't going to work. We're going to talk about that in a second here, in literally within one weekend. So the Optic guys have to realize like, hey, we need to give this a month, two months, whatever, to see if this roster works, work on our issues. And if it doesn't work, it's time to pull the plug, whatever that looks like, because they can't afford another year as the biggest org in the game of being third, fourth, fifth, sixth fiddle to the better teams. So that's just my frustration because I want Optic to be good. I want them to be competing with championships. It's better for the scene. And it frustrates me when they lose like this. Um, so that's a bit of a rant, but go online. <laughs> um, about that map four versus Rocker. Have you guys, I mean, you would have, but you know that situation where your team has five points to win, the other team needs to hold the entire hill, and you just frantically try and make the hero play to just get those five seconds, like, by yourself? I feel like that's what occurred in that map, and each of them kind of just, because of the time to kill, they thought, potentially, they could break in through the side, get the time, have one of the other teammates come in, and then get the full hold, because they never once went for spawns, they were a little bit too frantic for that. They were just hitting the sides. And, oh, man, it was tough to watch. But I, like, after a little bit of thought, I realized, like, why they went for that option. But obviously, it wasn't the correct option. And then the map five, Illy got the worst timing possible. I was so painful, man. They that were really both was. not looking at it on the site. You made a nice play. Double shot punch to the face. Like, dude, I would have gone crazy. <laughs> and did you see the clip of him afterwards? Yeah, smashing the headset. He did a Toto Wolf, man. He did a Toto did. Wolf. <laughs> and, but he had probably, like, the most unlucky series I've ever seen. Like, him personally, he just, everything that series against Rocker went wrong for him. And, yeah, I just feel really bad because he's the one, I think, going into the season was the most unsure part of that Optic roster. And I think he needs things to go right to get, like, the confidence. And I feel like the pressure is mounting and so i hope that he can turn it around soon for the sake of the optic team but would you be surprised to see a change if it was you know continues in this trend i don't think it's so a, yeah go on austin so you know I, I actually have a lot to talk about i'm, I'm glowing white here because i have like three spreadsheets up looking good <laughs> but uh so like i don't like i think this team like I have like huge amounts of respect for Ray and Troy, but this team, like, I don't know. I will say this. They are just like us. They are playing horrible and they are bringing it to a game five round 11. I will say like, that's impressive because right now they are playing horrible. I would say, but the good news is, is like, they're two rounds away. They're like two plays away from being two and out, right? Like they could very easily be two and out. And that's something that if I'm an Opti fan, I'm I'm really happy about, right? And I'd be happy that they're they're still winning maps, they're still bringing it close. I'm just not happy about their like their S and D. That would be like one thing. But like right now, like if you go to map four against Minnesota, uh, they were out rotated uh, out of thirteen hills, they were out rotated eight times. So they were only had a chance to hold five times, right? That ain't acceptable. I I personally, that's what I think. Against London, map four, they got outroaded six, six, six out of ten hills. They got outrotated on, right? And, uh, or no, I had it opposite. They, they rotated to six or to five out of the ten hills, but they only hold 20%. They only held one out of five times. That, that's, that's a glaring issue. In S and D, they have a 37% opening dual win percentage. So they are starting most rounds 3v4, right? That's pretty unacceptable, right? That's not a good one. And if you're starting 3v4, right, and then you have a sniper out, you're basically playing 2v4. So they're playing 2v4 most of these rounds. Especially on not offense. only that, yeah, not only that, but they're not planning the bomb. They're not planning the bomb at all. Like, there's zero risk. So they are the slowest planning team in the CDL right now. Out of, like, if you take plant times in, in, in even strength rounds, they are the slowest planning team in the CDL right now. So... Not only are they not holding in hard point, they're not getting first bloods in, in S and D. They're not planting the bomb. Uh, they're giving, you know, these free bloods away. You know, there's just a lot of like negatives. Um, and obviously, 
I would, if again, if I'm them, I want to have these struggles now because this is great film. Like you're getting, they now have ten maps that they just played, and probably like eight of them you can take, you can take good film away from and just break it down and, and get ahead, which is the positive. Again, they're only two and zero, oh, and they could be very easily be two and they could be two and zero oh right now if Illy didn't get double wobby bopped in the in the mouth. Uh, and and I don't remember what happened to London, but like one one thing like. I, I've seen like talked about on the flank is, you know, you're, you're not getting out of Dashy. Dashy went forward 15 in that match against Minnesota and SD. That's just not good enough. Like you got to put away the sniper. It's not working. Mm-hmm. You're not getting opening duels one. You're not, you're not planning the bomb. So the, the sniper is just not effective in, in without those happening. Like the sniper right now is, is either good at getting first bloods or it's good at holding down post plants. And if you're not getting first bloods and you're not planning the bomb, I don't know what the snipers you're supposed to be doing with the sniper. You're just in a difficult spot. You're in a very difficult spot with that. Um, so, like, there's a lot of, like, layering issues that they can obviously fix. There's a lot of stuff I know they will be fixing. They're just too good not to. They're too, they're going to be too well coached at the end of the year. Like, the, I, I just firmly believe that they're going to be very well coached. Um, but, you know, there, there is, like, one thing is, like, I have been pretty disappointed with, with Illy. I think, I think everyone can say. I and mean, obviously, it's only two matches. I don't, I don't I don't think anyone should be jerk like knee jerk reacting to any of it but a 0.85 is just probably not good enough and I it, and, and Dash has a 0.89 like right now their SMGs are performing very very well Scump has a 1.02 and he was he was the bright light at uh in the first series and then Shots is a 1.06 he was the bright light in the second series but right now I think at 4v4 like the SMGs move at such a pace, it's hard for them to IGL efficiently and micromanage and get it out there. Like Usually you want them focusing on themselves and how they're opening up the lanes and maps. So usually you want your ARs to be the, the good uh, IGLs and you want your SMGs to be able to speak, communicate what they're seeing, communicate what they're doing, communicate what's open. And then you want your ARs to play call and, and open up the map that way. That's just how I think. So when your ARs are really struggling, that's when you get to this point where it's kind of, it probably is fractured on the map right now for them. So if they're able to clean that up, like obviously I, th- I think it will get a lot better for them. I do. I just think they just need to, I don't know, just, just get it, get your S and D together, and then and then work from there. But I will say, like, for I haven't seen like these guys are really good at S and D, but everyone's good at S and D right now. I don't call anyone S and D stars anymore because like every team has an S and D star nowadays. Like it is what it is. Like right now, Dashi has a point five three in S and D. Illy has a 0.86 and Scump has a 0.83. Like, this is not good enough. That's not what you would call an SD, SD star. And even, even in the past, like, Illy had a 0.85 last year in SD. And, and, you know, when he was on the world championship winning Modern Warfare team, he ended with a 0.97 overall and he had a 1.0 in SD. And that's what I think his target should be. But you also need your star players to play like star players. And, like, I don't, so like, a lot of people are already pointing at Illy. For the struggles of this team, which I don't, I don't, I would never put the blame on one player because it's a system. It's it's everybody. If your teammates are playing bad, there's no hope for you to play good. It's a, that's just how it is. So I think you get your S and D together. You start one planning bombs. You start playing as a unit. You start bringing that mode together. And then you get you get your confidence for S for a hard point, and then you can just kind of start snowballing rounds together. But I don't think anyone should be like knee jerk reacting to like players and like really being negative because again they can be really easily be two and oh and saying the same things that like we are where we just said we scraped by you know we did we got by we're two and oh we're improving for next week so i don't know it's just a, exactly I no see, one would talk about it if those two yeah. round levens went the other way like it'd be a, a topic like, but like yeah you know. a lot of people I are like, like oh my god they're top 10 they're horrible get illy yeah. out of here i'm like come like let's calm it down yeah. for a minute yeah, Ellie was just in these like strange key scenarios where he got like very unlucky, and it was clearly what costed. I don't know. I guess like a map, like round eleven. That is the toughest situation to be in. But I agree. I think if Optic had won those series, I still believe the fan base would be charging on him in a negative way, just because you wouldn't really expect them going into the season to go to a game five with London or Minnesota, like and. In the lead up to the season, we were expecting them to be quite clearly a top three team, and they still could be. It's just currently doesn't even look close. I don't want to bring this up because it, it's probably I don't want people to get upset. But 
if this team had Crim Six instead of Dashi, like that rumored, like when when Scump was supposed to join the the Dallas Three, I'm not saying they would be better or worse. So no one take that out of context. But like, do you guys think having Crim as that leader, as that like IGL, would be more beneficial to this team currently? Because I saw like, uh, who was it that said they would rather have Lamar? And in there, somebody just it was said enable, that. Yeah. yeah. Enable put his dream optic team of minus dashy plus accuracy, which I thought was quite interesting. But I mean, I'm I'm inclined to agree. I put, I mean, we even talked about it last year. There was a clip we put on the channel. Like, if you put Krim on phase, what does that look like? The team probably doesn't get any worse. Maybe it gets slightly worse. Who knows? But I don't know. I, they were close to teaming. It was Ilian Shotzi seemingly that didn't want to have Krim on the team. Um, and they wanted to keep Dashi, which is fine, because I know that Ilya and Dashi have wanted to team, obviously, for a long time. Um, but just the way this game's played so far and the teams that are succeeding, I feel like having Krim on a team, the team is always going to have some element of, like, a consistency and, like, a, a flaw that, and some sort of clutch factor in the critical moments that the team seems to currently lack. I don't know. I just feel like there's a reason why Dashi has only won one event, and it was in 20. 18. It was 1,200 and something days ago. But yeah. I, I think know. Dashi is a generational talent, like gun skill wise. I just think he works better with a, with a good uh, like IGL around him. So, like, I just think, I think good IGLs have been so like thrown away in the past. And now everyone, it's kind of funny, everyone's starting to come back to them because they're starting to realize how important a good IGL is to like consistently winning. And I don't know. I, I think Illy can step up to the plate. I just think it's pretty much on his shoulders, like, unfortunately, because again, like, I think SMGs, it's really hard for you, the IGL. It's more, it's, they should be the ones that are doing a lot of the talking and what's open on the map, where they're hitting and stuff. And I think one of the ARs has to really, like, wrap it all up together and, like, push the unit, like, where they need to go. And it, it's, unfortunately, it's going to be on either Illy or Dashi. And I, I don't know... I just don't, I don't know them personally. Like I know Illy, I've talked to Illy before, but I don't know Dashi personally. I don't know if he's very vocal in game, but like I, I think it is more on Illy to be that vocal leader, and I think he can do it. I just think he has to find his voice and like really be assertive. And sometimes I think that's hard for him because his engagement numbers the past three years are very high. So so it's like the same thing with the SMGs. Like he's he's very in the mix as well. He's very fast paced. So like. It's hard for you to IGL while you're also... There's a reason why entry fraggers aren't the one play calling in CS and Valorant, because they're in the mix. They're so worried about themselves. It's more of the support guys, the slower guys. So it's, it's just a tough team composition. Um, they're going to have to find, you know, unlikely solutions to their problems. And, you know, just they'll get there. I, I do have faith, because you've got way too much talent on that team to be uh, a top eight team. You have way too much talent. And you have way, you, those two coaches are amazing coaches. And it's just, there's just too much there. I don't know. There's, I just, I don't know. It's tough for me to like see like all like the hate. And I don't know. I just, I feel like eventually they're just gotta, they gotta click. They gotta go back to basics, go back to basics and start rebuilding your confidence. Cause right now I feel like they're just, I feel like there's no plan sometimes. You just see, you see Bruce pull out a, a sniper round 11 on Bocage and he's sniping River. And I'm just like, in a round 11, I would rather you be playing with your teammates and hit something together because the defending team's going to be very passive and wait for the post plan and wait. I don't know. I just feel like sometimes like their plan just has to be a little bit more concrete, build up the confidence, and then they'll, they'll get back on track, you know? I just feel like they'll get there. Yeah. It feels to me like they should get there. But And what's quite interesting is that we would probably round this segment off by saying, well, look, you know, it's way too early to make changes. Just see how stage one, stage two, how it goes. But my take is like they don't want to make the same mistakes they made last year of being a top four team all year and not making grand finals. However, over the last few minutes here, as we've been live, Crone has dropped his first bomb of the season that New York are making a move. And from what I hear in DMs and stuff, this is indeed the case. This isn't like BS or anything. Neptune is getting dropped. He's out of there. He's now playing in challenges. We have been 
so I was, you know, we were going to say that, um, look, it's you know, way too early to make changes, but New York have decided within one weekend of matches that matter, uh, enough's enough. They've seen enough. They believe Neptune's not the fit here, which is quite a remarkable thing. Like, this is in- incredible, really, if they're making a change this early. Of course, we were going to talk about how they had a pretty shambolic week. They obviously have a very tough schedule. They got bodied by Seattle. Um, they even got beaten by LAG, which is never really a good sign. And Neptune, over the course of both of those series had combined like a 0.79 or 0.73 or some horrible stats which i'm sure maybe someone can find um but whatever the stats were it's not just the kd but it's like if he was having that kd but having insane engagements then it might be okay but i'm pretty sure he had like some of the least deaths as well so it really felt like he was kind of just stuck in a weird spot and this is such a strange one because you'd have thought that, okay, Neptune, like, Krim wanted to play with this duo. Obviously, the guys wanted to play with this duo with Hydra and Neptune. Um, clearly, the first couple of weeks hasn't really worked out. Um, but even Clay said himself, they've only really had 10 days of practice since mid-December because of Hydra went back to Europe and then getting everyone back in business. Um, it's, a, it's a strange one. And then Neptune, after underperforming for a little bit, you'd have thought that, like... Maybe he's getting put in tough spots or the way that Krim and Clay are playing isn't really working. Like we went into some listenings with them and Krim was basically just saying, look, Travis, calm down. Or like he was talking talking in a way that you might talk in scrims or when you're trying to improve as opposed to in an actual match setting. Um, and I guess statistically they thought for whatever reason, he's not a good fit. And they've decided let's actually not try and improve this. Because uh, Enable said, and there's been a fair bit of talk, like, if a team doesn't hit its ceiling quite quickly, then it's time to go. Like, it's time to make a move. And New York are not, they're not holding around, right? Like, I did not predict that New York would be the first team of the season to make a change, but that seems to be the case. Neptune's out of there. I don't know who's coming in. Um, there's been some talk about this Johnny guy from Challengers. I imagine it's a North American Challengers player. They're He's probably good. already practicing with him, um, whoever it is. And, um, I mean, yeah, that, that's quite something. If Florida managed to flog Neptune onto New York and then one week into the season, he's getting dropped. I mean, uh, mm. what to say? I was surprised by New York's bad week. I did not think they would be this rapid to make a change. <laughs> what do you think, Lyon? Uh I feel like because of where the league kind of changed last year, bringing, out, bringing in challenges players so often, it's kind of become a trend for teams to when they're underperforming to just instantly make a move for these new young players and i think it is quite a smart play because the season isn't really that long like there's until the end of the season there's only what five months so they may as well if something's not working and clearly within scrims and stuff there must be a dynamic that's just not working with that team and so they just decided that we may as well get some new talent in to see if it works and previously it's shown that that does work and if they get that player before say another team gets him, they're the first one to really scratch the surface of the talent pool in challenges and they get the first grab at these players who have already proved themselves early in the game in challenges. It's like Standy last year, you know, if they go for a similar route because Standy to Rocker made that, sometimes you've just got to make a move, like, and that's the thing, if the longer, if you just know, like if the guys just knew that this team isn't going to work, then like, why wait, right, I guess? It's a strange one. Think what about players right, that came in season last year. So the Insight, Hydra, Standy, like who else Afro. came in? Mid-season? Afro, exactly, Afro. And they're like four of the highlights of the year. And, um, and so if that's Paul proven, like, yeah. Paul X, yeah, as well, Paul X was great. And stats-wise, he was actually, if you looked at his stats, it was actually some of the best. And so in regards to that, I feel like they've just been put under pressure early on and they're just trying to make it work. And I don't think they're doing it in an LA Thieves sort of way because LA Thieves got a little bit rogue with their changes. I think that this, like, they'll know what they're doing. And I think Krim has the mind for Call of Duty, obviously, to be able to know what works and when something fundamentally isn't working within a team. So I think making that change is actually quite a good move. Yeah, so I'll touch on New York first. So I think they're the, one, the biggest disappointment of the, the first week because when you have Krim and Clay... I just think those two guys, I really respect them. I think they're two really good ARs. I think this is Krim's like best game in a minute. I think like this pre- gives this gives me like pre uh the early World War II vibes line. Remember like where he was like dominating the two Ks and yeah. he was playing really I I don't know, I just I he plays really well right now. Um I think they're SMGs. Like what was the thing we had a problem with at the beginning of the year? 
It's communication. Like, coming out of the Florida camp, it was like, maybe we had a lot of communication issues. And then, like, I hear uh, in the reverse sweep show, like, they're talking about, like, Zuma saying, like, sometimes Paco is kind of hard to speak with. You've heard that a couple of times. You get, like, a little, like, not, like, you just get communication problems, like the micro, the small talk wrong, and it, and it leads to, like, airs, right? And then in that first listening, what's the first thing you hear Krim saying? Slow down the comms, because it's just frantic. And he literally says, Paco and Neptune. And I'm just like, uh, well, first off, you're targeting them in the middle of a match. It's kind of <laughs> it's kind of tough. But, like, it just points to everything being disjointed on the communication front, right? And then you go and look more into their their stats right so neptune has a 0.76 right now so does clay not good right clay is a 0.55 in hard point he's really struggling right in in s and d hydra has a 0.38 really struggling mm-hmm. neptune 0.57 this is not good enough right those two guys hydra and neptune 0 and 8 in opening duels not good enough hard and in control the complete weirdest thing the, their two smgs are so slow they get like like 39 engagements per 10 minutes. Their ARs are playing way faster than them. Clay is getting thir- 47 engagements per 10 minutes, and Krim is getting 43. So their ARs are getting way more engagements than the oh, SMGs. That's so strange. So Hydra and Neptune are playing really slow. And I don't know what's causing this. And, and ne- Neptune only has a 0.53. So his, his, most of his engagements are not positive engagements either. So it's like, that SMD duo, SMG duo is just not performing very well. And I don't know why. It could just be because the whole team's not performing. But like they are not doing well. And it's, and it's both of them on many different levels. So yeah. it's very weird. And then, so, you know, if, you're not, if it's not fixable, I understand where you're, where you're going with that. But I think one, like Hydra needs to speed up a little bit. And I think if Neptune is the one that's going to be going... Like, I don't know. It's just a tough spot. It needs to be right rapid, now, though. Like, to keep up with the know. ARs, you need a rapid entry sub. I don't yeah. know. That's my take. But both of your SMGs need to be a little bit faster, and they need to be able to communicate really well in this game because it's really fast-paced. Your SMGs need to be perfect on communication. That's why Toronto's very good right now. That's why Seattle's doing really good right now. Communication is on point. You are never going to be able to consistently win and beat the best teams in high-pressure moments if your communication is not there. And that's, that, that was the issue, like the red flag going into this team. That's what they were experiencing. And unfortunately, they, I, have, I will say this, they've had the shit take where they've had a lot, they've lack of practice. I think Clay said they've done 10 practices since, since December, which sounds very Ooh. low. I don't, I don't, but he said 10. Ooh. And uh, that sounds very, very low. That sucks. That's, that's a really, um, I, I, I that this, you no know, team's going to be good on that. No team is. You're just, you're obviously going to struggle. Now, I, I see people saying, like, oh, Johnny is the one that they're picking up. So I'll touch on him a little bit. He is the complete opposite of what they are struggling with. Okay? I just said their two SMGs are really slow, right? Oh, Johnny is number one in the NA Elite for Slayer rating, which means he is fucking moving. He has a 97% Slayer rating, which would be number three for the CDL behind Sib and behind Gizmo. He would be the highest SMG. So I kind of like where you're going at. Let's deep dive a little bit more. Their two SMGs have a combined 0.4 KD in an S and D, right? That's horrible. Oh, Johnny's KD in S and D a 1.44. Okay, I like where we're going. You're you're identifying issues and filling the gaps, right? So you got those two. He he's really fast paced in control. He's really fast paced in hard point. That's a red flag for the NY SMGs. That's what you're getting, right? That's a good pickup. I like that. If that's honestly where they're going, he had a 1.1. Went over for over the first two days. On day three, he played Spartan Co. 1.25 KD. Then he plays uh, Welly and Co. with a uh, uh, Mochilla, Noisy, and Chris Radio. And Welly, he posted 1.25 again. He had a really strong performance. I definitely liked how, how he played in that one. He went 37 and 23 in the Gavutu hard point. We all know as an SMG, it's very hard to get get yours on that map, and he he got his. So um, I think if it is him, he came out of nowhere. Uh, obviously, yeah. like a lot of these guys, um, I do really like breaking down like these these young kids coming up. So like I like I like seeing where he's coming from. There has I will say there has been some speculation around the logistic of uh, the, the the legitness 
of these stats because there has been people, but I feel like that's like a rite of passage nowadays. Like if you're very good, people are always going to question you until you actually prove it, right? You saw it in Awakening, and I think Awakening is one of the better gun skill flexes we have in the CDL. So if he is the real thing, I, I'm actually like really happy he's getting his shot. He, he like obviously it's only been one two weeks of elite, but he's played really well. I don't know about the rest of the cups and everything, but just based off what I've seen, you know, he's in he's in Timmy Phantom's teams and Dylan Rex. I love those guys. Those guys have like a really good understanding of Call of Duty. So like they, he's been he's been put with veterans who are really learning. And uh, I don't I don't want to disrespect the last who else is on there. Uh, Scrap. So it's the UIU team. Scrap. Um, and so I, I actually do think if that is who they're going with, and you look at the red flags on New York, he covers a lot of those. Now, if you bring him on, you just have to speed up Hydra and, in, and, and, and improve the communication and maybe, maybe slow down your ARs, right? And get practice because obviously that's an issue. That helps. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and I would be sucking up everything this kid has for, for S&D because like obviously he's doing something right. His team is really good in S&D and New York struggled in S&D really badly. And their, their SMGs were horrible. And like every and every, like both of them were horrible in opening duels and kills, just everything. So, yeah, I I, I don't know. I just don't like making roster moves this early, though. Like, do you guys think like <laughs> right now the for, after the first week is when you you pull the trigger? I feel I like think, they know better than we do. <laughs> yeah, it's also true. Um, and I also feel like Clay, um, he's definitely the most aggressive AR we've got in the league. I think that's pretty. Would you say that's fair, Austin? Like for the last two years, two yeah. three, yeah. And he always had so in 2019 he had Simp and Abizi with him. He the next following year he had Illy and Shotzi, and then the following year he had Paco and Asim. Okay. Oh Mac? yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, and uh, then this Asim. year we got Neptune and Hydra who are playing slower than him, like you said. And like I feel like he always needs to have the SMGs be on the same page. As him, hundred percent, hundred percent, them to get the most out of their team. And yeah, that clearly isn't the case right now, and they're searching for a player who will fill that role. And I like that a lot. And it was the same thing last year, actually, too. Like Hydra was Hydra and and Asim had like their engagement differences. Um, like I will, say, Hydra's a naturally slower slot sub, right? He's more of like a scump, more pre aim, more Slayer heavy. He's less, he's less entry. He's less like speedy. That's where like I thought Neptune would come in and do really well. Like if you remember on Florida, he actually had a lot of engagements. Um, yeah. And I thought that was a good plug. Um, but sometimes you need both your SMGs on the same page, on the same speed, so your ARs are more connected. And so right now, the the engagement gap between your ARs and SMGs is is, is a pretty big red flag. You don't want it to be that big, especially with both your SMGs. So yeah, I do see how. I think maybe Clay and Krim might have like tried to overcompensate on like the speed aspect, and that kind of like I just feel like everyone's just trying to overcompensate and it hurt them all, you know? Yeah, like yeah, like last year though, I feel like with Neptune, Cold War was such a slower game, like so much slower that he might have been used to getting certain kills on the map, and now that that's not the case, he's kind of yeah. confused with how fast to be. Um, but he's meant to be that entry SMG, so he should be having some of the most engagements in the league. But that isn't the case. They they have to find the stage two form. Like, do you remember when Hydro was at his best at Garrison? He, he was yeah. dropping like one point four. Do you remember? Like, I can vividly see what the mini map looked like. It was three arrows not moving, and then Hydro just running, yeah. <laughs> right? And and so that way, Hydro was the one getting the most engagements. He was the one mo doing the most on the map. And then the other three were stagnant. They were holding down lanes. They were locking down and they were play calling. They were micromanaging. And that's like where they need to get back to. Right now, it looks like Hydra's not moving. Neptune wasn't moving. And Clay and Krim are flying, which probably hurts Clay what and Krim's that? ability to micromanage, which is, I think, their greatest asset is like they're so smart. They can, they can move around the map like, like chess pieces. So I don't know. I feel like they'll get there, though. I, I, that's another team where it's just like, I have so much faith in Krim and Clay. I just think they're such a good duo. They're such good ARs. I like how they command the game. I just think like right now, obviously they just haven't had enough practice. And right now the roles, they're just. Ha I feel like it's a big, this is a big role clash and speed and like like pacing clash. It's just not there. It's just uh, it was just always going to be a a mixture for failure. 
uh, for this first week. But again, like it's early. I do hope Neptune goes down and try and like works on his pacing. Like maybe he was a little bit caged. Maybe he was a little bit like unsure, like overthinking the game, and maybe he can go in there. I would actually love to see him join up with like Timmy Phantom's team and, and plug back into that team if if that's um that's if oh Johnny's the one coming out. Um, yeah. because I like it, that way he can get his confidence back, get back into a system. Cause like the thing with Timmy is he's very slow AR, but he's very good at like locking down lanes. So it opens up other parts of the map for you. It's like, it's like what gra- gravity is really good at that too. So like, I, I do hope he finds solid footing, regains his confidence and we'll probably see him back in the pro league sooner rather than later, you know? Yeah. I feel like it didn't really affect his stock too much cause it was such a quick change. <laughs> So he still has that on his side, like his performances yeah. from last. He's also not necessarily going anywhere. Like he's still on the bench. It's not like, and that's uh, the thing with we... making a change this early. I know that they're probably not going to bring him back, but you know, it's just, if you make a change, let's say they made this change in a month or a couple of months time, there's probably a lot of other teams making moves. So, you know, you probably get a trade or something and Neptune's out of there. Whereas this way you can pick up a guy. You didn't even have a substitute before. Now Neptune's your sub. And if someone else wants to pick him up, you can. And if you want to bring him back, you can. You're, you're probably not going to get challenged for Neptune for at least like a month or two until teams maybe make big changes mid-season, right? So I don't know. It's a very interesting one. We have to move on, though. We've been cracking off for so long. We still have some stuff to discuss. I want to yeah. talk a little bit about the Selium stuff. We have to mention it. Big controversy of the week was the um, aim assist through the wall. So this is a <laughs> problem in the game has been since well honestly for a long time modern warfare it started to become talked about because uh selium you know if there's a feature in the game which is abusable selium likes to use it to its full advantage it's the type of player he is um you know some people like him for it some people don't that's how it goes so modern warfare the kind of famous one was on piccadilly there was the ticket booth and there was a clip of selium i think he was laying down kind of swiping left and right and if you feel a little bit of an aim assist tug as you're going back and forth, you know there's a guy there. And um, this was also noted. I mean, it was supposed to just sell him this weekend. A lot of players were abusing it on Desert Siege, for example, over at the trains on the left-hand side of the map. If you're standing in a certain spot, you can swipe back and forth and you'll get aim assist through the trains. You'll be able to feel if someone's there. There was one particular round where I think he, I guess he felt that a little bit of an aim assist tug fellow was there, said to a BZ Halos, double nade it. They get the kill. So, you know, look, there's snaking, there's other things but a lot of people would say this is effectively abusing a feature in order to give you free information that you shouldn't be able to get um which if anything is more egregious than the other ones so the question is what do you do about this um of course it is a problem in the game it's not something that's easy to fix aches was suggesting that it's if someone's doing it deliberately it's very obvious that that's the case of course it can happen by accident it happens Probably every series, at least once, someone gets aim assist through a wall, um, which isn't ideal, but it happens accidentally. Whereas if someone's doing it deliberately, especially because now esports engines seem to have everyone's POVs, they could theoretically police this to the point where if you're caught doing it, there's some punishment comes into effect. Kind of like how Clay's doing doing which one, though? (laughs) Yeah, well, I'll pass it to you then, Austin, because obviously you're on phase, your perspective might be different. um, But it, it just is an awful look for the stream and for the broadcast where they're just doing this and the stream doesn't really want to talk about it and you're getting free information that you shouldn't be able to get and get effectively control and lock down an entire side of the map as a result. So it's like, they got to deal with it some way. I'd prefer to just try and GA it, but I don't know about that. I will, I'll say the same exact thing I said last week for the one way. You cannot police intentions because... With this one, too, I'll touch on it a little bit more, but you cannot police intentions because basically what's going to happen is you're going to say, if we catch you doing that, like you're gonna, it's going to be like, like you'll be able to get in trouble, right? And then teams are going to find ways to hide it because there's already, like, because like right now, when you're doing the swiping thing, that's obvious, right? But what if you're yeah. strafing? What if you're just throwing a shoulder, right? And it looks like you're just shouldering. You're, st- you're still doing it. You don't, even, you don't have to be aimed in to do it, um, which is the problem. You could just be not aimed, aimed oh, really? in, and it will, you'll feel it. And there's seven different spots on oh. that map, by the way. Seven. You only, you only saw one. He's been, he's been tested, baby. <laughs> no, no, we don't, we don't use... Like, you saw the mid one on, 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 by, by Desi, like, when he was yeah, through yeah, the doors. Yeah, 
I saw two other ones where people were scanning walls, like the breakable walls. It has something to do with the breakables. Um, but also with the trains, like where the, the trains are on the side, it's something really weird. But the problem is, is you just can't police intention. So I'll say the same thing we said for the one way. If you cannot fix it, get it out of the game until it's fixed. Because we didn't even use that until a pro team in scrims did that against us. And that's when we were like, oh, shit, that's like an instant lockdown on that side of the site. And then every single we scrim... We don't use it, it someone else is using it. Yeah, no, no, that's what, yeah. we didn't know. It was like right when Siege first came in, and then someone did it. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, and then every single team besides like two, who I don't even think they knew about it yet until after we scrimmed them, did it. Like every team, just like that was just the instant setup with someone was up there doing the, the scan. Every team was doing it. But the problem is, is it's MC, and MC gets like a lot of hate. So, but I won't defend it. It looks cheesy. It is cheesy. It's broken. It shouldn't be in the game. And if we can't fix it, get the map out. That's yeah. pretty much. It's just that simple, map that the right? key issue is. Well, like, you can do it on Demiansk too, but that's obviously that's why Demiansk isn't a, a CDL map because you uh, can so do yeah, that through everything. So it's basically just Siege. It's the issue. Okay. Yes, which is why Crowder was talking about it, and he was like, "Look, I think we can fix Siege because it's a Siege and Demiansk specific issue. It's not like you get that on Castle. It's not like you're getting that on Berlin. It's not like you're getting that on Bocage. So it's something about those two maps that's broken that just yeah. is messing up with." Amos's. Not the end of the world, then maybe. Yeah. So yeah. like, I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here and defend it because that's just stupid. It doesn't look good. It's cheesy, and you can't, and you can't police intentions because the problem is, is literally this happened to us in the middle of a one of the biggest tournaments ever. I won't even say which game because then people might get angry. But some there was a G8 spot on the map, and then it got pulled out in the middle of a grand finals, and like no one. No one, no one ever said anything because that's not why you lose. You don't lose a map because of one spot. But like, you can't police intentions because in the biggest moments, it's gonna happen. Someone's gonna pull it out, whether it's intentional or on accident or like. Yeah, then the CDL has to decide. Like, all right, you know, yeah. what do we do? We forfeit this guy. Like, oh man, it's, it's, that would be a nightmare. That they open the door to a nightmare if they were to do that. So. Yeah, so it's really tough. I just, I, I don't. I just think it should be out of the game because, like, right now everyone's just gonna do it. It's just that's just what that's what what it is right now. Is just everyone's doing it to each other because you have yeah. to. If you don't, then you're putting yourself at a disadvantage for the map. And like, yeah. that's the same thing I said about the one way smoke, though. So like, I'm not trying to be like biased just towards like our team. Like I said the same thing about about uh, one way smokes. It's like it, it's gonna be in the game. Someone's gonna do it on accident. I don't even think Draza did it on purpose. I'm trying to give Draza the benefit of the doubt. I thought I think he thought he had a stun or something because the way he threw it. I, I really don't think he did it on purpose. I don't, but I, th I think eventually it's going to happen. And like, I don't know. I just, I just think I, I would not want to have the CDL have a 50 50 play where they have to police. And I don't want players to accidentally do it. And then the other team thinks they did it on purpose. And then now everyone's just doing it back and forth to each other. And it's just, it's just dumb. So I don't, yeah. I don't, and I don't want it to happen in the middle of a big tournament. I, I don't know. It's just, if it's if it's broken, get it out of the game. If you fix it, you fix it. Because one, I think Desert Siege was the best map we had, like setup wise and how it played. So I want it back in. I just don't want aim assist on that side of the map be broken. If we can fix that, yeah. great. If you can't, get it out. Yeah. If it's a mechanic in the game, like I've always thought the same with snaking, with like G sliding, uh, slide canceling. If it's a mechanic in the game, people are gonna use it. And it is really difficult to decide whether they're doing it on purpose or not. But then I've also thought, think about like actual sports and when someone commits a foul unintentionally, they still get penalized the same for it because yeah. they did the same act. So I feel like it could be policed, but because it's, I guess, a video game, uh, slightly different. But yeah. Yeah. The thing it's is, it's like complicated I... to police as well. Like, if, like yeah. what, would you, what would you actually do if, if they say, okay, that's not allowed? Like, do you forfeit the round? And if you forfeit the rounds, then like they've got to restart. Like it's just a mess, right? Um, but what we there think, no, just finish yeah, this like, up. Okay. Yeah. I also don't want it. I don't want the game to become who can hide it better, because that's just dumb too. Because you know, people <laughs> yeah. are gonna find a way. Like, oh no, I'm just shouldering. I'm not. I'm not doing yeah. it. I'm just. I'm just Stop shouldering out here, right? So like. That's that's literally what it would get to is is who can do it who can hide it better and I think that's I mean, just that's as cheesy as it opening happening or openly happening so. Maybe would change the pacing of how they would snake to make it look like they were just crouching 
as opposed to that's what full on kitty snake. They did that. They did that last year, right? I thought they fixed snaking because it wasn't really a big issue towards the end of the game. I think they they fixed the camera so it didn't camera as much. So I don't know. I feel like they can fix it. We just got to give them time. I, I think for right now, it should be taken out of the rotation. And I think if you can fix it by stage three, stage two even, like miracle fix, maybe it's just a hot fix. Maybe it's something it can do early. Just take it out until then. Honestly, I think we have Kavutu, we have Castle, we have this new Casablanca map coming in. If we were forced to have five maps, I feel like we could do it. Mm. I think you at least need four. Um, so right now, pick 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 one map to just replace it. Um, because I, I just don't want I don't want people questioning. I don't want I don't want viewers being upset. I just it's not really competitive. Take it out. Same thing with the one way smokes. That's that's all. Keep consistent with with both issues. So I'm trying to stay unbiased as possible. But it's I mean, yeah. Funny point yeah. from Roosevelt here, really. All right, that's a foul. Turn off your aim assist for the rest of the map. Like they put you <laughs> in the tin bin or something where you've got to stand in spawn for the like the first forty five seconds of the round. Yeah. If, uh, you imagine that, like, if, okay, you're caught using it, there's a foul, okay, this guy gets stuck AFK in spawn, and then the whole team, it's a new strategy, right? You've got to, okay, can we get through to the spawn to kill this guy before he gets to play again? Man, this that's is, um... Cool that. This if it is was what we like, need. Oh, like, yeah, you'd you have got... to, like, protect your guy who's AFK, you know? Well, they used to do in Halo. I was like, nade setups and stuff, like, three nades come flying in. <laughs> so if you, got, if you got technicals, so they would give technicals if you, like, shit talk too much, if you did like some like said some crazy shit, so, like Maniac got one one time. That's the only one I really remember. I remember mm -hmm. two actually, but Maniac got one, and he got teed up. So what they do is you can't play. You you have to put down your controller for a set period of time. So you can, <laughs> if you can imagine that. if they teed that. you up, if you, if they oh came out, God, just imagine like fucking courage in a in a ref shirt. <laughs> You're teed up, oh, and you have to put down your controller for for a round or some shit. I like that. <laughs> It would be actually fucking hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, I think mate, I think I heard that actually. You had to put like for the whole map or something. They did it. It was like it was like three minutes that because like capture the flag is twelve minutes. So he had to start the first like three minutes of the CTF without playing. So he was just three teed minutes. up. Yeah, it was three minutes where the team had to play three before. It should be like twenty seconds, I think. Can you imagine That's if we had that though? One. That'd yeah, actually be I mean, fucking hilarious, bro. That would be hilarious. I I could already picture the tweets, man. <laughs> That's all we need. Yeah, you just gotta hire. You have to hire a ref to come out there and. Yeah, actually yeah. do it. Like that'd be that'd be elite. <laughs> Disrespect. But... Absolutely, let's go. Okay, well, we've been going for an hour and a half, and it's time to get into predictions, baby, because we've had a great episode. There's been some things that have been thrown at us from left field. But, um, yeah, if you want to bring these up on the screen, Omar, I don't exactly know what you can see. If it's not perfect, let me know. But um, they've changed the format slightly this week for the schedule because Sunday, of course, was, is Super Bowl day. Um, so what they've done instead is they've taken the Subliners Thieves match that would have been last game on Sunday and put it on Thursday or Friday, sorry, instead. So there's now four games Friday, four games Saturday, two games Sunday, which um, is maybe not quite as fun for us in Europe, but it's still uh, maybe better than doing it the other way around when the viewership's going to disappear. So I guess just looking at these games, guys, I just want to pick out a couple because there's some here that you think are relatively easy to predict, but I think there's some that are very spicy and with huge implications for how these rosters might pay, play out going forwards. Um, like, I think a lot of these are relatively tame. I think a lot of the big ones will be in the final week. But, um, I mean, some of those thieves caught my eye, first of all. Right? We're going to see this New York, the new roster, whatever it's going to be with its fourth player, against Thieves. I mean... That was a banger before because it was, and it's already hugely important for New York. Because if they lose this one, they're probably not making winners. Um, so the pressure is really on. The Thieves are also zero in, in one as well. So, so many of these teams, the pressure is massively on to make winners here at the major line. Yeah, I think um, that's the match I'm probably most excited for because I don't know if it's 100% confirmed yet, but the change is looking like it's going to come in. Uh, LA Thieves have looked a little bit. Rocky, that's like they've continued the same trend from last year. Um, I expect them to be a top team, but as of right now, it seems like these two teams are the most uncertain. And with this, like, I've had the strangest like expectations for them. I expect them to be so much better early on. But um, yeah, I'm just excited to see the the dynamic of how this New York team changes with this this change. And I think that having it against a team that's sort of in a similar 
like category to them tier if you will um is like really uh, intriguing so i think if i was gonna pick right now i think just because of a honeymoon phase that this new york team might have i think i'm gonna go with new york for that match but i think it'll be close because this la team has a lot of potential I like that call. Like, what do you think? Um, you want to pick at another match, Austin, just to, to mention? Because the one that really catches my eye, I guess, is Paris Optic, because there's so much that rides on that. Because you know Paris took you guys close. I mean, who knows what happens if Optic lose this one. Um, and then also the other one I was kind of looking at was London Gorillas. I'm kind of interested to see if London can keep up this great form and if LAG can continue the small resurgence that we kind of saw against New York. Yeah, so I think... The matchup I'll, I'll, I'll target is... There's actually a lot of good ones this week. It's got to be um, you that breach, right? That's a pretty good I, one. I'll leave that one out just because I don't want to like toot our own horn. Uh, I'll do Minnesota-Seattle. Um, I don't think that many people are circling that one on their calendars. But honestly, I think this is a very good test for Seattle. I think, I, think obviously, I still have Seattle winning this. But I think this is a very good test for Seattle because Minnesota... Again, as they always are, you know, shout out, you know, Brian St. Looney, uh, their, their analyst, Alex, they're very well coached again. They're very intelligent, which means they're going to be very, very good at the more high strategy games. So they, they have a really, really big advantage in, in S&D and control, which uh, coincidentally is where Seattle is really good at right now. And they've been really good at Hardpoint as well. So I think this will be a good test for Seattle to see where their S&D is at, see where their control is at, because this is, Minnesota is going to be one of the top like best teams at that. Um, I think they'll probably be like in like the, the fourth best team at those modes um, moving forward. And, you know, like Austin, Toronto, uh, our, our strengths are usually control and S and D. So seeing how you fare against a team that's good at that, that's a pretty good test for Seattle. Um, I have high expectations for them because, you know, obviously our boy, Brandon uh, is their GM and analyst. Yeah. Our, uh, our, uh, I mean, I think we're all, we all love Sam Phoenix. The man is the man could you know I have a five minute conversation with him and I think I want to run through a wall for him so like those guys I I really I have such high expectations for them but like this is gonna be a good like check them game you know like this is gonna be a good game to see where they're at to see how they're progressing uh you know I don't know I just I just I feel like that's gonna be a really strong strong matchup I feel like that's gonna be the one where you're gonna see a lot of high level play so I'm really excited to watch that one. And unfortunately, yeah. Minnesota, you got the you got a grueler of a stage one schedule, bro. They go from they went from uh, Optic, they got Seattle, they got London, right? That's that's grueling. Well, they let's got add you guys, to that. Atlanta. Then they got Atlanta, what? and then they got LAG. Oh yeah. man, what did we well, say at the beginning of the year? Some team's gonna get screwed on these pre pre made schedules. It's true. The first but, team, know? first team up is Minnesota to get get tucked i mean new york yeah, actually look sucks. at new york's schedule what's new york's schedule because i think this might be worse or equal they got they, seattle LAG, they just played seattle lag lat next? boston and then atlanta so they got a tough one too yeah. also pretty tough yeah maybe not as tough as rockers but i think rocker though you wouldn't have expected their schedule to be crazy but it's just how the teams are shaped. <laughs> out of yeah, nowhere. Yeah. When the guy was nowhere. making it he was like yeah seems about right it's middle just of the pack like, right yeah it's pretty reasonable like Nike? <laughs> yeah. No, not at all. Because because honestly, like if LAG LAG Seattle and London just came out of nowhere, right? That's the problem with these pre made schedules. Exactly, Those teams yeah. like Seattle, London came out of nowhere, right? You can't pre plan that. And then LAG looked pretty like woeful at the kickoff, and then they turned it right around. They turned it right around and they're starting to look like a threat in like almost every mode right now. So <laughs> it sucks for Minnesota. I actually feel bad for them because this might be like Mike looks amazing right now he looks really good and like I, I saw so many good plays out of them this this last weekend like this minnesota team i really hope they don't start losers because this this might be like the best they've looked since you know they won the championship and uh stage four last year so or was it stage five it was stage five right five, so man. uh yeah you know but to go back to the main point that yeah that minnesota match versus seattle i would I, if all seattle fans i'd be watching that see where you're at all CDL fans, like if you want to see high level S and D in control, I think that's going to be the matchup where we look at and we're just pretty like, okay, this is where uh, this is the, this is where the the two top like two top teams in that modes are going down at. So I'm excited yeah. to see that. 
I'm also excited to see if Optic can... So Optic need to win their next three matches, most likely, to make it to winner's bracket. They yeah. won't need to own... win all. I think they just need to win two. I think two well, and three is enough to get winners. It, it might not be. Need... It might not be. They have decent yeah. map count, though. You'd think three that is... would be enough, but it might not be. Yeah, but three is... Like, they're lock, pretty much... Lock, three guarantees yeah. it? Well, technically, no. Because you... Yeah. Not? There's no way they no. can... No way, so... right? So if two teams go 0 and 5, oh there okay. is a chance where three, like six, three and two teams could tie, and two of them won't make it. Wow. Yeah. So that's a good. I mean, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. Mm. Right now, that's I think, crazy. Actually. <laughs> yeah. I think okay. we can all agree for this Paris matchup, the most obvious videos ever should be Kavutu Kavutu, right? Get out of there. This because Paris they actually looks choice, very though. very confident. Flip, baby. <laughs> So coin flip league back again. That's the thing. Yeah. If that if that Paris if that Paris team gets Gavutu hard point and that's in, in uh, control, I I'm a little bit I, I would start questioning because Optics S and D has not has again has not looked good. So if you're getting a strong matchup in, in hard point, a strong matchup in control, and then Optic not looking good in S and D, I mean there's no way in hell Optic loses. I'll say that right now. There's no way. They're hungry. They're gonna be so hungry this week. They're they're probably coming out for blood, but like, I I would just be I, I those are the two vetoes you gotta yeah cut that off I'm right there. Avoid that, yeah. I just think Optic gonna come out with this like, I just think in search and destroy they were just playing so passive and scared. Like I don't know if they just run at stuff and take gunfights, they're just gonna win against basically every team. So I don't know. I, I think that's they need to think about. Doing because as you say, they're not even plotting the bomb. It takes them so long to plot the bomb. Like get in there, get in the mix, win, get the first bloods. Like not rocket science. Um, but look, that's where we're gonna leave it. Lion, any final thoughts before we close out the show? We had a great one. We covered so much ground today, um, and Two I'm sure hours. it's gonna be the same as we go as we go forward as well. Um, yeah, I just want to say after this week, I'll still be uh, leading predictions. <laughs> I'm catching up, bro. Oh, three, it three wasn't days, a great eight, end me. of the week today. I'm not gonna lie, but uh, it could be worse. Could be worse. Hey, I should have ten out of ten, but Optic Gaming can't win a series. Me and Zuma, baby. We we yeah. we're the only two that guessed that Minnesota. Oh, Minnesota. Yeah, it's a good yeah. prediction to be fair, given the uh, given the game fives. That's the thing. I was thinking Optic 3-1, but if it goes game five, I was taking Minnesota. It's always a tough one because I feel like Minnesota are game five. Like I always kind of want to pick them, but then I always think they'll lose the respawns. <laughs> <It's> so... <laughs> Which is kind of true. <laughs> um, anyway, that's where we're going to close it. Thanks all for joining. Thanks all uh, for sharing your time with us today. It's been a great time. Uh, we'll be back this time next week, breaking down all the, I'm sure... More drama. There's always drama. It's Call of Duty. Uh, thanks to those watching in, I guess, in, well, in the future from now on YouTube, other platforms. Drop us a like, all that good stuff. Uh, we'd appreciate it. And we will see you this time next week. So thanks for watching as always. Take care of yourselves. And we'll see you next time.